How, how many of you guys uh, bought an Alexa and then put it in your bedroom? Some of you guys? And then did you read all the articles, get it out of your bedroom? Because Alexa's listening when you don't want her to. We, we have Alexa in the kitchen and she makes me nervous because she thinks I'm talking to her and I'm not. And so she responds, I'm hoping she's responding, or maybe she's initiating a conversation with me and that's a little unnerving. But then we have Siri, so we have two competing AIs who seem to always be paying attention to us. And with Siri, she's great. She's, she's full of information and insights and, and she's what every partner should be, always listening, right? <laughs> always responding to us, always caring about what we think and what we have to say. But between Alexa and Siri, we're moving into a world where everything is voice activated. It's just crazy that everything around us is voice activated. You're going to walk into your house and say, lights on, lights off, turn the TV on, turn it off, change channels, remove my roommate. I mean, whatever you want. <laughs> That happened in that moment, you're going to be able to voice activate it. It's going to happen. And it's crazy. In fact, my daughter Mariah, who has a daughter named Juno, and Juno's not quite two years old, but Juno's already picking it up. In her own almost two year old language, she gets up and says, Alexa, play old McDonald. <laughs> she realizes there's someone out there that if she could connect with, would give her everything she wants in life. There's something powerful about communication, and it's moving further and further into the world of artificial intelligence and technology, and we're making these incredible advancements, but we still haven't figured out how to communicate with each other. We're still struggling to know how to have honest, clear, healthy communication between two people if you're married, or between two people if you're dating, or between two friends or a colleague or employees or employers. In fact, all of human relationships come down to communication. If you don't learn how to communicate effectively to be heard and to hear, your life is always going to be breaking down. You're never going to figure out why things aren't working. And it's always going to come back to this singular competency of communication. So we shouldn't be surprised when that's the same reality when it comes to God. So many of us, we've learned so much about God, and we, we believe things deeply about God, but we've really never figured out how to navigate what it means to have a relationship with God, to walk with God. And it all begins in this whole space of communication, and, and a lot of us talk at God when we're saying we're talking to God or talking with God. But it's hard enough. I mean, how many times have you prayed? That's what we call it. But really, in the end, you don't know if it worked. You have no idea if... God was paying attention if he responded, how he felt about the prayer, if he just got bored and tapped out. You have no idea how the conversation went, and much less if you try to evaluate hearing from God. It's mysterious enough to know if you're talking to God and it's working, but it's really difficult to know if you're actually hearing from God. And, and, and I think many times what happens is that even though we have faith, we just conclude, well, God doesn't really speak unless... You've lost your mind. I mean, there's some people who, oh, I heard God speak. And it, it, it makes me nervous when people think that God's an audible voice out there. That usually requires medication, not faith. But yet we believe there is a relationship with God that actually is formed in the midst of communication. And that's where we're finding ourselves in John chapter 10. Because we've been working our way through the gospel of John, looking at our theme, 33 AD, the legend of Jesus. And, and in John chapter 10, Jesus begins talking about what it looks like to have an intimate, dynamic, authentic relationship with the creator of the universe. In John 10, beginning in verse 1, Jesus says this. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the, the sheep pen by the gate, but comes in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. 
but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. This is once again one of those places where Jesus speaks in metaphors. He speaks in parables. He speaks in allegories, and images. And, and in some places in the scriptures, it tells us that Jesus spoke in parables to make things clear. And some places it tells us that Jesus spoke in parables to keep things mysterious. And what you discover is that Jesus uses parables in some of the same ways that psychologists use ink blots. When they ask you, what do you see? It's not what's on the tablet that actually matters, but what you perceive is there that tells them who you really are. And Jesus has a way of unwrapping stories where he can see what's inside of the listener and he can understand their motive, their intention. So when Jesus tells this story, it's both simple and complex, clear and confusing, depending on the motive of the listener. And of course, Jesus uses the metaphor of sheep and shepherds. And I don't know why, but sometimes people who grow up in, in the Christian faith think that the Bible has all the spiritual language. And so since Jesus talked about shepherds and sheep, we should always talk about shepherds and sheep because we all live with sheep all around us. So we understand the full meaning of this metaphor. And, and it's so ironic that thousands of years later, the person on this platform is called the pastor because you're sheep, right? Is that the way it's supposed to play out? But if we should change the metaphors, if we're going to be more contextualized, like last night, there was a helicopter over our house and he stayed for quite a long time. And there was another helicopter circling because there was a car chase. Everyone understands that. If I said, and the kingdom of God is like a helicopter hovering over your house while police cars are chasing a singular car, some of you go, oh, I remember when that happened to me. And, and some of you were the person driving the car. I don't know your backstory, but, but you need to realize that Jesus was using a metaphor that was real in that time. And so they knew what it was like to have Sheep, they knew the role of shepherds. That was an occupation that was common. And so Jesus uses this very common space to talk about an uncommon reality. To let them know that a relationship with God is actually not about knowledge. It is voice activated. It's not information activated. Jesus begins by saying, very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but by some other way is a thief and a robber. So he's already giving us this basic contrast. There's a shepherd that actually protects the sheep, and then there are strangers who are thieves who want to destroy the sheep. And this scenario is happening at the same time to the same people. And before we dive in, into that part of it more deeply, I want you to see because it's one the one who entered by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. And then he describes the sheep. He says that the gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. So Jesus actually begins by saying, I want you to understand something, that human beings are designed to hear God. This isn't Jesus explaining how sheep work. This isn't Jesus explaining how the relationship between shepherds and sheep work. What he's actually trying to help us see is how humans are designed in relationship to their creator. And what he wants you to understand before we can go any further, you need to realize that you are designed to hear God. It doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean it's simple. It means it's true. And you are designed for this, and you may live beneath your design but it doesn't change your design. And even if you do not believe in God, you are still designed to hear God. 
which can be so confusing when you hear something that isn't there. It's part of the reason a lot of us go through an immense amount of mental complexity, chaos, and breakdown. Because human beings are designed for such an elevated level of communication that when we're living beneath that level of communication, our minds go crazy and go into chaos. It's kind of amazing when you think about human senses and, and, and the way we're designed, and then also how other species have those same senses, but at a more intense level. Like we can smell, but in fact, not all human beings can smell the same. Some people have like the smell of a basset hound. I mean, my, my, my wife smells smoke everywhere, even when there's not smoke, but she does smell smoke. And, and I, I don't seem to have the same nose for smoke, but she can smell it. Some people, they can, they can smell aromas. I have a very, very defined nose for aromas. I can smell things, and I can tell you almost what's in something as all the ingredients that are being cooked. But some people, they can't smell anything. I don't smell the garlic. How is that possible? Are you dead? And how can you know that, you know that there's cilantro in there? And some of you have a keen sense of smell. There are people who have an incredible sense of taste. Some people have no taste at all. But, but there are some people who have an incredible sense of taste. And Now, some of you have been designed just to taste salt and grease. And that's what you think is flavor. But there are other people who have a refined super taster capacity. And, they, they, and, and don't, don't go eat with them. You'll be hungry when it's over because they'll take you some bougie restaurant where the food is about this small and you, you can put it in, into your hand and then they call that the main course. And, but they don't care about volume. They care about uniqueness, the uniqueness of the flavors. And, and there are some people who can see further than others. And even when their eyesight isn't lost over time, some people have an incredible ability to see distances that are, that are almost superhuman. In fact, I have a friend who was um, intelligence for the US government. He would always have to let the government know when he was leaving the country. And he told me one day that he had directional hearing. And I said, what's that? And I said, is that where you choose not to hear people? So, you know, I have that too. And, uh, but he goes, no, no, directional hearing is when you can be in a crowd of hundreds of people. And I'll pick a person in the crowd and I'll focus on that person. I can hear their exact conversation. That's like an awesome superpower. And yet, no matter how profound our superpowers are, there are dogs who will always hear better than us. There are bats who will be better at echolocation than we could ever be. There, there, there are hawks that will have greater eyesight than we could ever imagine. And so even just on a physical level, our capacity within our senses is so extraordinary, but it varies, and some people have more than others is it possible that even when we look at nature, we realize that there are species on this planet who have seemingly superpowers in comparison to our ability that, that we actually have layers of capacity to connect to God, and some of us are living as if we are blind or deaf or have lost our taste because we're living only experiencing the material world and not the spiritual reality that God designed us for. So you are designed to hear from God. That, that may not mean that you are aware that you hear from God. And I, but I do want to throw this out. Even if you do not believe in God, I'm absolutely convinced you are hearing from God. You just may not know it. It may be bothering you, troubling you, irritating you. And sometimes you call that your conscience. But here's the reality. Is that When we think about God's voice, we sometimes think about it out there. Oh, if you're going to hear God's voice, he's going to speak to me in an audible voice. No, that's called insanity. God comes to dwell within you. God is to be the inner voice, not the outer voice. You will only begin to hear God's voice when you have an intimate relationship with him and the conversation is coming from the very core of your essence. So God's voice doesn't come from the outside in. It comes from the inside out. Listen to what Jesus says. The sheep listen to his voice. You cannot listen to the voice of God if you're incapable of hearing the voice of God. So Jesus is saying, up front, I want you to know you can hear God's voice. I want you to realize that. You are designed by God to hear his voice. 
And he says his sheep call his own out by name. And so God designed you for an intimate conversation with him. It's not just a group talk. God wants to speak to you uniquely, individually. Even when you're in a room with people, God will not give you a group message. God will give you an individual, intimate message in the middle of the group. And he calls out his sheep by name, and he leads them out. And so God's not just trying to have a therapeutic moment with you. Hey, it's just good to see you. There's love to hang. You know, what do you want to talk about? God wants to have a conversation with you to lead you out of the life you were not created to live into the life you are created to live. He has brought out all of his own. He goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. A part of the measure of spiritual maturity is knowing the voice of God. It's not about how many years you've believed in God or how many years you've believed in Jesus or how many years you've been a person of faith, but how more clearly is God's voice to you now than it was then. It's incredible how a person's voice can become so recognizable to you. When you love someone, you can single out their voice in the middle of a crowd. Have you ever watched a bunch of moms going to find their kids? Like when I hear a bunch of kids screaming, it just sounds like white noise to me. It's human chaos, and yet every mom knows which kid isn't theirs. The way you know is they're not upset. Everybody else's kid's crying, mine's not, I'm fine. But the moment their kid cries, they jump up and they know. Because identifying someone's voice accelerates by the intimacy with that person. You are designed to hear God's voice. The question, though, is have you learned how to identify his voice in the midst of all the noise? Because one of the things that we can learn from this conversation that Jesus takes us into is that, is that we have crossed wired comms. Jesus says there, there are several voices. In fact, he tells in verse 5, but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. In fact, Jesus alludes to the fact there's not just one stranger, there's a lot of strangers who are trying, trying to speak to you. They're trying to call you out. They're trying to woo you to themselves. They're trying to convince you that they are the voice you should listen to. And so you have all these voices in your head. Have, have you ever noticed how crowded your brain can get? It's kind of odd when you think about it. You don't invite people in. They just sneak in. And they get into your head. You're having all these conversations. And you're not even sure of all the voices in your head. Which one is you? Because you and you can fight with you all the time. And what the scriptures are actually teaching us, what Jesus actually tells us, is because we're designed to hear God's voice, we are an open system of communication. And there's a lot of communication going on in the unseen reality that we're unaware of, but it's connecting to us and we can actually hear it in our head. Have you ever been on the phone with someone and someone else walks into the room and starts talking to you? And it's, it's kind of rude, but you're trying to be polite, so you're trying to listen to both people at the same time. And a moment later, you realize, I have no idea what either one of them said. <laughs> it can be so frustrating when you have multiple voices, and that's just two, speaking to you at the same time. When it's three, it becomes impossible. And it would, it, it's, it's so challenging when you realize there are all these voices trying to get your attention, vying not just for your attention, but for control of your mind at the same time. This is way probably before your life experience, but, but when Kim and I were young, we would drive in our car across the country. That's the way we would vacation or go see someone. We'd go 1,000 miles across the country or 1,500 miles across the country, and, and we would share the driving, just me and her. So I would drive for 8, 10 hours, and she would sleep, and then she would drive for 30 minutes, and, <laughs> and, and I would try to sleep, but would be terrified. And... and <laughs> And then when I watch her surfing off the road, I'd say, oh, sorry, I got it. And then I would drive another four or five hours, and she would sleep. And then she'd drive 15, 20 minutes, and, uh, and I would panic. And, and 
And so that's how we would travel across the country. And so one of the ways I would stay awake, I would do two things. Internally, I, I would work on math problems for a couple of hours and in my head, which is one of the ways I would entertain myself. But, but the other thing I would do was I would turn on the radio and find like a talk show. Talk radio seemed to keep me awake more than music. Especially if there was a game on that I could watch, that I could listen to the game and that would keep me entertained. But have you ever traveled to a place where it's almost like no man's land? And you start losing the one station, but you, but you're, and you're almost getting the next station, but the stations are starting to like get staticky and, and you're trying so hard to keep it. You're trying so hard to keep it, but on the same exact frequency, all of a sudden it's another station. So you went from an NBA basketball game to George Strait in country music, like, no, I didn't choose this. This is not my choice. But, but it, it shifts on you, and you have no choice. It decides what you're going to hear. And you're trying to change stations, and everything's in this, in this no man's land. And then sometimes you hit one station, you get two stations at the same time. And you're hoping so much that the one you want is the one that wins. <laughs> but you know which frequency wins? The one you're moving toward. You lose the frequency, not the one you like, or not the one you say you prefer. You lose the frequency that you're moving away from. And you keep the frequency you're moving toward. What you need to realize is inside of your brain, you are, ha you are the ground, the battleground of competing frequencies, which is kind of strange. My brain or my mind, it's inside of me, it's in my skull, but it's also outside of me, it's out here. Everything inside of me is supposed to be under my control, right? Your brain should be under your control. I mean, everything else cooperates. See, my arm, my head does what I tell to do, left, right, left, right, see, it's like, it can't go, no. In fact, it can go left. See, it'll do it even before I say it, because I think it. It's like, it's like, a, see, like I just said, ha. Huh. I didn't have to say it. I just thought it. And I hopped. I said jump higher, but that's all I've got. And because uh, every, everything in my body, everything about me is under my control. I do me. I choose my words. I say what I think. My lips move when I tell them to move. Y puedo cambiar idioma si quiero. That's how much control I have of this universe inside of me, but not my thoughts. My thoughts do not understand. They belong to me. They think I belong to them. Which is the terrifying thing, right? You ever had a negative thought and you're trying to get rid of it, it just keeps coming back? How does it do that? That would be like your arm just doing its own thing, like, you know? I mean, imagine if you're trying to eat like spaghetti in your arms, it's like, no, you know, I do what I want to do. You, you, how could you function? But that's the way your brain's working. Your brain is as if you have limbs that do not cooperate with your thoughts, with your intention. You have all these thoughts in your head, and you need to realize that you are a mixed calm. You have competing frequencies vying for your attention. And they tell you different things about you, about your life, about your worth, about your future. And so you have some frequencies that will tell you you have no hope. Some frequencies will tell you there, there is no God. Some frequencies will tell you that you have no future, that you have no worth, that you have no value. And those frequencies may have gotten into your head early in your life, and those frequencies are so strong. And then you have other frequencies that tell you you can do this. You can fight through this pain. That there is a reason to live and what you need to realize is that you have these competing frequencies and you do not have the capacity to stop those frequencies from attacking you. Jesus actually tells us there are thieves trying to steal your life. Now, if you, if you knew a thief was trying to steal something from you, would you do something about it? I mean, I, I would, right? I mean, we, we live here basically in Hollywood and... And, you know, we have helicopters over our house pretty much every day, sometimes every hour. 
and there is a lot of criminal activity all around us. And in fact, our neighbors have had so many break-ins, and so Kim lives really concerned about crime and uh, about people breaking in. I would never lock the doors and would drive her crazy. And so every night she says, you need to lock all the doors. And if I miss one, she lets me know first thing in the morning. It's like before, you know, good morning. It's you left the back door open or go, thank you, honey. Thank you for the update. And uh, <laughs> I'm working on personal improvement. And so I'm, I'm, I'm getting there, but, but she gets really nervous. The other day I went to the movies and she sends me a text in the middle of the movie. And it's just wrong. Okay. I'm just saying there are two sacred spaces, church and theaters. And, and <laughs> you, you don't text people or call them during those times. And, and so she texts me, she goes, I hear a noise in the house. No, I hear noises in the house. She goes, there's people, I think there's people downstairs, I think somebody broke in. She said, I'm scared. I mean, Ant-Man wasn't that good, so I wasn't that upset, but, <laughs> but, but I was a little frustrated because this has happened to us so many times over 39 years of marriage. And, and I want to go, honey, there's no one in the house. But she'll, how do you know you're not here? I can hear them. And I go, honey, it's okay. Just lock the bedroom door. Let them have everything. Okay? Just, it's all right. No, no, I'm, I'm scared. And, but I have to act every single time like it's real. Because you know what's going to happen. Like the one time I just blow her off and go, there's nobody in the house. Just stop it. You're paranoid. There'll be 18 thieves in the house stealing everything. And the police will come and go, you didn't believe me. You didn't love me. And I, so I, I can't, I can't let that moment happen, so each time I have to act like we have a break-in. But I don't really care that much about the things in the house. Just got to be honest. A huge reason why I don't worry that much is, like, well, she gets rid of furniture all the time anyway. So, you know, <laughs> this time it just happens without our choice. And <laughs> the only thing I really care about are the people that I love. Just don't take them. Take the stuff. But Jesus says there's a thief and he's trying to break in and you don't even know what he's trying to steal. See, the thief is not trying to steal your possessions. He's not trying to steal your fame. He's not trying to steal your influence. He's not trying to steal your possessions. He's not trying to steal all that stuff that you think is valuable. What he's actually trying to steal is your life. But how does he steal it? Because how do you steal a life if your life is inside of you? He steals your life through your thoughts. And so that thief, Jesus says in chapter 10, verse 10, comes to rob and to steal and to kill. And his methodology is to steal your life by taking ownership of your thoughts. Do you have mastery over your thoughts or do your thoughts have mastery over you? Jesus says there's a stranger and he's speaking into your soul. And some of you, you hear that voice. And some, some of you, those voices are stronger than the voice of God. They tell you that you do not matter, that you're not worthy of love, that you can't be forgiven, that you're going to always carry that guilt and shame. Some of you, those voices are so powerful. They're telling you that you are foolish to have hope to believe that the future can be different, that your life can be better, that you can be better. And those voices have become so powerful that those voices that were once strangers have become you because you've owned those voices because you believe them. But Jesus then tells us, this is where you can begin to know the difference between my sheep because my sheep understand that the voice they listen to shapes who they are. That faith is actually voice activated. Then Jesus shifts his metaphor. Because in verse 6 it says, Jesus used his figure of speech, figure of speech but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore Jesus said again, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. Now he, he shifts. He was the shepherd. Now he's the gate. Now, anyone who majored in English knows you're not supposed to mix metaphors. You can't be the shepherd in the story and then be the gate in the story. But Jesus is God, so he can be as many of the things in the story as he wants to be. He goes, no, no, I was the shepherd, but now I'm the gate. I'm the shepherd leading you to the gate, now I'm the gate. See how I do that? Flip. Now I'm the gate, 
leading the sheep. But one thing's consistent. I'm the shepherd, I'm the gate, you're always the sheep. And he goes, and all who come before me are thieves and robbers, but my sheep have not listened to them. Listen to that. Sometimes what we want is we want God to silence all the voices that are destroying us. You ever wanted that God just silence those voices? Silence the voices that tell me that I don't matter. Silence the voices that tell me I can't be loved. Silence the voices, God, that tell me I'm not enough. But Jesus says, no, no, listen to what he says. He says, but the sheep have not listened to them. Here's what you need to know. You have control of the volume. You control the volume. So you have all these voices in your head, and some of them are just screaming at you and sucking all the life out of you, stealing all the joy, destroying your hope, damaging your faith, and you're listening to those voices, and you'd be going, God, could you just silence all those voices? And that's not how God works. God says, no, I'm speaking to you, but you control the volume. So turn down the volume of all the voices who tell you who you are not and turn up the voice of the one who tells you who you are. And by the way, this is why it can be so frustrating. You ever had anybody in your life that you love that just won't listen? They just keep making the same stupid, self-destructive choices over and over and over again. And so you try to get louder. You may even just lose your mind. You start yelling, you get mad. Why won't you change? Why won't you make a different choice? But you need to realize is that they have that volume off so they don't even hear you. They are deaf to your words. It doesn't even matter how loud you get because the volume is theirs to control. And that's why sometimes when you feel like you've lost control of the volume of all negative voices, you come to a place like this. Because you're hoping that maybe if someone else could speak into your soul, someone could just find a way to to just nudge the volume of hope and nudge that, that volume of faith and nudge that volume of forgiveness and nudge that volume of life. And maybe somehow you could hear God's voice again. Or maybe for the first time. But you, you've been designed by God to hear his voice. But because we're in a conflict, you have mixed comms and you have multiple voices speaking to you at the same time. And because you're created in God's image, you have control over the volume of those voices, but you must decide who will you listen to? What voice will you elevate in your soul? And by the way, one of the ways you can know if you're listening to God more carefully is when you listen to people we're saying the same thing that God is saying. We, one of the things I love about little Juno, she's almost two years old. I, I love those moments where she chooses me. And uh, they're rare, but those moments are really special. But one of the things that's so funny is that I'll FaceTime with Mariah and, and FaceTime with Juno. And the moment Juno sees me, you know what she says? Mimi, which is my wife. So she sees me and she goes, Mimi, Mimi. And I go, hi, Juno, Mimi. I love you, Juno, Mimi. Oh yeah, Mimi, Mimi's here. She's over there. Mimi, she wants you. And then I give Kim the phone and Juno, and Kim will be so happy because Juno picked her. And she go, hi, Juno. And she'll go, Poppy, Poppy, <laughs> Poppy. And I go, ah. <laughs> and uh, all I have to do to choose me is not see me. But what's happened is that in her development, she's learned to identify people together. So when she sees one, she knows the other one should be close by. See, what happens when you hear someone who's speaking life into you, someone who's telling you the truth, when it resonates with your soul, what actually happens as you draw close to them is you're actually drawing close to God. You just don't see them in the picture yet. And the moment you realize, oh, the reason that 
that that person's voice actually affects me. The reason what that person is saying is actually doing something inside of me. The reason that this message is, is getting under my skin, it's not because you see me. It's because in proximity to me is a God who's speaking to you, but you don't even know he exists. I've had so many people tell me over the years, oh, that just really spoke to me. I want you to realize that if my words were not in the frequency and resonance of the God who's speaking to you, it wouldn't have that effect on you. You just don't know how to see God yet, so you see people who see God and hope that he exists. And then Jesus says this, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to kill, to steal, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Why does Jesus start by talking about the voice and he ends by talking about the life? It's because there's only one voice that will give you life, and that's his. Life is voice activated. It's that moment you realize, oh, God is speaking to me. It's that moment you realize, I don't know how this happened. I didn't even know I believed in God, but now I know he believes in me, and I, I hear his voice. It's that moment something starts to move inside of you and there's turmoil in your soul and you can't make sense of it. But you know more than anything in the world, you hope it's true. See, faith is voice activated. The scriptures tell us that when we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that's when salvation happens. And I want you to know that what God does when you open your life to him is he speaks into you life. And some of you, you need that more than anything in the world. Some of you need God's voice speaking into your soul saying, you matter. I love you. You're forgiven. You're free. Watch what you're going to do now. You can't even imagine your future. There's a voice waiting to speak into your life. And if you'll listen to that voice and lean into that voice and let that voice lead you, you will experience life in such abundance. You'll feel it's unfair. You've been given so much. Would you just bow your heads with me and just close your eyes for a moment? Life is voice activated. God wants to speak life into you. But you control the volume. If you're here today and you're ready to trust Jesus with your life, you're ready to cross the line of faith, you're done struggling through life alone, you're ready to receive his forgiveness, his freedom, his future for you. I'm gonna ask you to pray a simple prayer. It's one sentence. These are the words, Jesus, I give you my life. That's how simple it is. But today, because we're talking about life being voice activated, I do not want you to pray that prayer in your head. I do not want you to whisper that prayer. I want you to declare it. If you're here and you're ready to trust Jesus with your life, if you're here and you're ready to cross the line of faith, if you're here and you're ready to make this the day you choose to follow Jesus, right now, out loud, I just want you to say, Jesus, I give you my life. Right now, voice activate your faith. Right now, just declare it. Jesus, I give you my life. If there's only one of you, just say it out loud right now. Jesus, I give you my life. Life is voice activated. That's why conversation with God is your source of life. If you just prayed that prayer, Jesus, I give you my life, I want you to raise your hand right now and I want to pray for you. 
Beautiful. Father, keep your hands up. Keep them up. Come on. Reach up to the heavens. Receive what God has for you right now. Father, I pray for every person in this room who voice activated their life today. And I pray that they would hear you speak into the depth of their soul. You are alive. You are alive. You are alive. I pray they would hear every word they need. You're forgiven. Your past is your past. You are a new creation. Step into your future. God, speak into their soul what they need to hear right now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Can we just thank God for all those who responded to him right now? All right. I'm going to give you an appendix real quick. I don't talk about the devil a whole lot. I did that whole talk without even saying that name. I don't like giving him a lot of attention. I prefer him to be ignored. But here's what I want you to understand. In the Bible, there are two names that are fundamentally used for the devil, Satan. One's deceiver, slander, the other one's liar. There are voices that will speak to you every moment of your life, trying to convince you that God is not for you. And I want to challenge you this week to silence those voices, to reject them, to call them out as a thief trying to steal your joy, your life, your hope, your future. But faith is also voice activated. So I want you, and I don't usually ask you guys to do real practical things. I want you to start getting up and start practicing making declarations in the morning. Get up in the morning and pick one. Today, I'm gonna to have more courage. That's a good one, right? Today, I'm gonna to be kinder. Maybe some of you need that one, right? Today, I'm gonna to have the courage to be kinder. <laughs> Today, I'm going to see people as valuable. Pick two, three declarations. Don't go overboard. And in the morning, write them down. And just in the morning, out loud, out loud, declare them. What I do know about Satan is that he cannot read your mind. But he can hear your words. So pay attention to what you say. God can do both. He hears your word, he reads your mind. He also changes your mind when you invite him into your life. So activate your faith, because life is voice activated. Love you guys.